see if this one, oh good, that's perfect. That is perfect. So um, a quick disclaimer for all of the uh, press folks in the audience. Um, this is supposed to be a panel with Richard Spires. And so uh, what I want to note is, um, if you have any quotes you find to be particularly interesting, they were said by Richard Spires, uh, CIO, Department of Homeland Security. Um, especially if they are about to get somebody in trouble, uh, which I seem to be expert at doing. Um, I have um, participated in this survey on both sides of the table quite a number of times. Um, I must say it's more enjoyable to be surveyed than to be the surveyor uh, from, uh, from that perspective. Uh, what's very friendly about doing these surveys is it really is a conversation with friends uh, pretty much off the record. I found one quote from myself that I think is pretty identifiable uh, in, in the report, but then again, I gave folks free license to go ahead and do that. Um, and it's, it's a very valuable tool. So I think most of what I want to do, since I, I primarily was looking forward to a panel, and, and especially with Richard, they tend to be pretty interactive. Um, I have some thoughts uh, relative to looking through, uh, through the report. Uh, and I thought I'd talk about those for a few minutes and then kind of said, look, you know, on any of the topics in here, uh, what would you like to talk about? Uh, those of you who know me and have been around the circuit for the last two years um, know that I'm not shy. Uh, and I probably will tell you what I'm thinking unless, of course, I've been explicitly told I can't think that uh, for, uh, for these things. And sorry, that doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> You know, it's interesting to me to look at the report from the perspective of what's changing and what's staying the same. Uh, I think I, the first one I did was the probably the 1998 report. I seem to remember being about September of 98. Uh, I may have the timing wrong, but being uh, interviewed. I'd been in government for two months at that point, and boy, was I a newbie to, uh, to government. So what I thought at that point in time might not necessarily have had a lot of correlation to what the other CIOs thought. Um, it's interesting to see um, where security sits every year. Could I assure you that every CIO in the federal government thinks about security a lot. Um, everybody in the audience knows what, uh, what we face from an information security standpoint. Uh, I guess I am very pleased to not be the CIO of Sony uh, today. Um, um, you know, we have been through that uh, at, at the VA. Uh, thankfully, our laptop was recovered with no uh, no breach of the information. But we've also learned a little bit. Of, oh, thank you very much. I thought you were standing there with a camera. I said. We've been through our own uh, there, and you know we've gotten very transparent uh, as a result of that on the information breach side of things. Um, for the press folks in the audience, you know that we do a monthly uh, review of the information breach uh, report that we send to Congress, and then we talk about anything else that the press folks want to talk about, which probably is the more interesting side of things these days. I'm really pleased. I've been able to lead that uh, discussion off for the last few months with, sorry, this is such a boring information breach report. <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, the other thing is, um, CIOs in the government perennially have the issue of they don't have enough control. And they're absolutely right. Um, I'll say it now, get it out of the way. I've said, I think, every speech I've made um, for the last year. VA as a pilot program is a tremendous success. If you provide the CIO with control over the IT budget and the IT resources, he or she will look at it like a service organization. He or she will apply the IT disciplines we all expect. He or she will make uh, dispassionate decisions about good IT investments and bad IT investments, not worried about um, how do I have to cover up the money so it stays protected. Um, there are a lot of very, very, certainly tying the agency together uh, into one logical organization, optimizing infrastructure and other pieces. 
We've got a lot of good CIOs in the federal government. Uh, all of them given the same opportunity uh, to have a centralized control and move forward with, uh, with a plan to really rationalize their infrastructure and their agency. We do the same sort of things that we're doing at VA. These are good, solid professionals. They know how to run an IT organization. We need to change the way the federal government looks at IT and do what private sector organizations have been doing for years. Treat IT as a substantial investment. I, uh, I loved um, Jeff Sainz's graph uh, about a week ago um, at, at the White House relative to the performance gap between the federal government's utilization of IT and the private sector's utilization of IT. And I believe uh, Jeff appropriately looked at that as an opportunity. We've got to recognize that the reason we do information technology is to dramatically change the results of our business processes. Not to incrementally change them, but to dramatically change them. And I think what we see is that uh, for a long period of time, the government looked at IT as an incremental change tool. And it's not. Uh, incremental change investment in IT is just not a great investment. Uh, complete change, dramatic change, those of you that are economists uh, would view it as Schumpeterian change, um, is what we're really talking about when you get in and look at what you can do with business processes with the real advances from an information technology standpoint. And that's what CIOs want to do. You know, networks and data centers and infrastructure are um, interesting but they're not the real leverage points. The leverage points at VA are in things like changing the benefits system from being paper bound to being a completely electronic system. When you look at VA, it's really interesting. You sit in a room with the Undersecretary for Health and the Undersecretary for Benefits. The Undersecretary for Health sits at the pinnacle uh, in the health organizations for electronification of, of the work they do. Um, it's tough to find paper in VA hospitals. Um, and the work processes of the doctors, of the clinicians, of the entire hospital are encoded in the electronic health record system. VA is at the forefront and has been at the forefront of that for years. And you look at the Undersecretary for Benefits, who still runs a completely paper-bound benefits system when the comparable in industry in the private sector has been electronic for years because it helps their profitability, it helps their customer service. And you look at the disparity between those two and you recognize the issue we've got is bringing the rest of government, things like the benefit system, up to what transformative IT can do for it. And until you bring all of that IT investment under the CIO, until you do some of the things talked about in the report, like prioritization, what is the most important thing to the agency? I can tell you, Secretary Shinseki has made that very clear what the most important things the VA are. We're behind those things. Our IT investments are going into those things that the Secretary views as transformational. And when you start to make those kind of decisions, um, and I'll talk about this in a second, when you start to set the priorities of the organization and use IT as an investment tool to drive those priorities, uh, you get a lot more out of the IT that you're doing. The report talks a little bit about uh, portfolio management. Um, and I look at portfolio management really in the context of customer service. This, for, for us at VA, the CIO's role in the investment process is to make certain that it gets run and to help the customers create the prioritization that then automatically turns into where are we going to spend our dollars. If you ask the Undersecretary for Health who prioritizes IT investments for the health organization, he knows who it is. It's him and his staff. Same thing on the benefit side, same thing on the, on the cemetery side, same thing on the corporate side. When we talk about needing IT investment in the infrastructure, my job is to convince them that as my customers, they really do care about network uptime. And not investing in that over a period of years will cause outages at the hospitals that they desperately don't want. And so playing that role. But in the end, when we come together in September with the prioritized operating plan inside of VA, 
that operating plan has been prioritized by my customers with my organization involved and is then booked as this is what we're going to go do. That's an IT investment process from the what do we want side. And then we add the other half of this is what can we actually accomplish? Because not every IT investment that we'd like to make is one that we can actually successfully do. And so we've been fairly uh, ruthless, I think is the word, about uh, trimming those parts of it. When you put those two together, you have a great IT investment process. Um, you know, I, I want to be uh, careful about not saying we don't do the formalized piece, but the real work gets done in the day in, day out between the folks. Um, we're coming into a very constrained budget uh, period. Um, and I think as a country, that's highly appropriate. We talked about what IT can do to help on that. You know, IT investment dollars are small compared to business process investment dollars across the government. Um, but as we focus on things, what we've seen at VA, and remember at VA, out of a $3.3 billion budget, we freed up $700 million one year by focusing on prioritization and on tight controls over our IT investment portfolio. Uh, we thought we had saved those dollars. Uh, some of them were claimed back, uh, but that's a different story. Um, but if you prioritize what you do, if you follow the investment piece of this, you know why you're making every investment. You're willing to pull dollars out of the lower priority projects and put them on the higher priority projects. You're willing to decide that this project is not going to succeed, and this one is. Let's move the money. You can get to the point where you're getting very effective use of your IT dollars. And that's what CIOs really want. Um, so I think um, oh, one other point. Uh, the key to a successful CIO, and every CIO knows this, is communication. Um, I know it's, for those of you that, uh, that didn't live in the old days of VA, this doesn't necessarily sound like a shocking comment, but it is. We don't fight with our customers at VA. And three years ago, that wasn't exactly the case. And the difference is, I think it's, it's communication and taking a view of customer service. We do not do information technology so that we can do information technology. We do it to serve the customers, both internal and external. We help clinicians provide veterans with better service. We help the benefits folks provide better decisions for, for veterans. We provide veterans with access to their information. There's not one IT system at VA that's there because the IT people need it by themselves. Um, and I think that's, that's a pretty clear thing that CIOs see as well, is communication. Um, and it's just a main part of the role from, from a CIO perspective. So again, I, I would tell you, I think CIOs know what they want. I, said, I think we know what CIOs need to have. I think we can turn IT into a highly productive uh, tool for the government. We're just having a discussion about um, uh, the president's comments relative to uh, IT and the federal government. And I think it's all a matter of, of uh, expectations and reference. What could our great technology folks do if they were allowed to operate with the freedom uh, from an acquisition, from an HR, from a variety of perspectives that uh, many private sector organizations are allowed to operate from. Um, one of the things we focused on at VA is getting management out of the way of the folks that are doing uh, the real work. And I think that's a, uh, a key piece that we need to stay focused on is we have great IT folks in the federal government. They produce some awesome systems. Uh, I think though that every one of them would agree that they could do an even better job if we could figure out how to better optimize um, the processes they have to operate under, and the things they use to get their tools done. I think that's what we have to stay focused on as CIOs. So those are just kind of my uh, my overall comments. I love the report. Um, I think it's a very useful tool. Uh, it really does come from the CIOs. Uh, you know, as you read through this, I can't tell you that I agree with everything, which means it wasn't written by me. It was written by uh, you know by a lot of folks. But if you've been through the process, if you've been through the hour, and if you're sitting with me, hour and a half uh, survey of what do I think, um, it's a great process and it produces a great tool. With that, let me uh, pause and take a breath and see if anybody has any questions relative to, uh, to the topics in the report that they'd like to ask about. 
And as Jason and the other press folks know, eventually we'll get to, yeah, but is there anything else you want to ask me about? <laughs> it's really bad when the press folks start hanging up on you because they've got to go instead of the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, oh, wait, I've got another comment. Sir, if you want uh, to step to a mic. You mentioned that the assistant secretary, I think, for benefits is completely paper, paper bound. Is that what you said? Okay. Yeah, the younger secretary for benefits, the, the, the compensation and pension process inside of benefits, which really is the major one, that's what 20,000 employees doing it, is virtually entirely a paper system right now. How is the CIO you know, trying to affect a change into something less paper intense? Uh, thank you. Um, this year and next year, we're putting uh, about $150 million a year into the Veterans Benefits Management System. And that system is designed to take the, uh, the compensation and pension system and take all of that paper inflow, stop it outside of our doors, actually NARA is going to do the scanning for us, hand us electronic documents, that, is, that are then uh, used inside of an electronic system um, with rules engines and other pieces to make uh, increasingly automated decisions on compensation and pension. The important part of this, I think, is threefold. One is, um, in a paper balance system, our flexibility of moving the work is very, very difficult. And our flexibility with changing the business process is, is, is small. So turning it to electronic there, adding the rules engine to enable automation, but most importantly, enabling the customer to think about what is our business process. The, the legislation and the court cases around how you will adjudicate uh, veterans' compensation and benefits is extensive. And so within that legislation, uh, the CFP organization has to operate. The electronic system, though, should take a massive uh, piece of their work out. I, I'll just give you what we're hoping for. Uh, this is not in any way or shape or form a guarantee, but when we implemented the GI Bill automation system, we saw their main work process to approve uh, someone going into college go from 45 minutes to 7 minutes because of that automation, because the automation in the rules engine, because of some level of automated decision making, because of reaching out to various databases to look for information in an automated fashion. So when you, as you can imagine, uh, when you increase throughput by six times in an organization on their main process, you can get a lot more work done with fewer people uh, just by implementing the automated tools. So um, yeah, you know, BBMS, we, we have 16 major initiatives uh, that we're working inside of uh, VA right now, the Secretary's Initiatives. BBMS is one of those. Um, and the others are equally exciting, if not all necessarily as IT-centric uh, as BBMS is. Other questions? Oh, wait. Yeah, we thank you. My rigor is here. She is going to ask the tough questions. No, no, no. So the question is, how is cloud computing doing within the VA? Or how are you using cloud computing? So um, the model I use on cloud computing is kind of a uh, three-level uh, model. And you know, at, at the first level, you would say uh, building an internal cloud. And probably our heaviest lift that we're doing right now is with that. We're building uh, what I would term cloud vista. <coughs> We're moving all of the, uh, the electronic health record systems out of the hospitals and into regional data centers. In fact, one of the things that uh, the two secretaries of defense and uh, veterans affairs have agreed is that uh, we'll utilize data centers uh, as part of our joint electronic health record system. Um, we, we are quickly achieving the point where Facility, the hospital doesn't know where their VISTA system exists and they really don't care. They have redundant communications in, uh, the system works, they have greater than 99.9% .9 availability of that system, 
and it exists somewhere. It's not in their facility. Um, you know, we could be running it in uh, you know the far northeastern corner of Maine or the far southwestern corner of California, or within the Cones borders, and they would or within the borders of the 50 United States, and they wouldn't care. Um, so I, I call that level one an internal cloud. Level two really is moving to uh, an external cloud, but knowing physically where things are. Uh, and we have done that extensively on the benefit side. Our, our uh, GI Bill system uh, and our VBMS system are both being done um, at non-VA data centers. Uh, I believe the answer is we don't own the equipment. Uh, we own the application. We certainly see an A. Uh, uh, certified credit. The, uh, uh, the processing system, because there's a lot of both personal identifiable information and personal health information on those. Um, but as far as daily operations and running them, I don't have to worry about those things. The third level, and the one that has proven to be most interesting for us at, at VA, is uh, what I would call, um, uh, if you will, personal cloud sort of things. The, the, the exact same things we're all used to. We go to Facebook and we use it. We go to uh, Google and we use it. We go to a variety of internet things. Frankly, we really don't care who the provider is. It's an interesting tool. We're going to use it for whatever personal or business process we have. Um, we've run smack dab into this, both in intended and unintended ways at the VA. From an intended standpoint, our um, social media outreach organization is building um, a great way of reaching out to veterans through tools uh, like Facebook and strong transparency and engagement there. And that really is a very good use of classic uh, cloud computing. Maybe a little less uh, intended is the fact that our residents have found some very interesting tools to utilize on the internet and you'll start to utilize them in providing patient care. Unfortunately, as the person doing privacy information and private health information, that causes me some issues there. But I think you come back around to something that I see on the horizon, which is we're not going to be able to keep up inside the government at building tools that are going to satisfy the demand of the iPad, iPhone, et cetera, users. Um, and if we, if we can't figure out how to say yes, our users are going to keep figuring out how to say yes despite the fact that we're saying no. And for those of us that are old IT people, are um, we've seen this cycle before, folks. We have. You know, if you insist on IT controlling, the IT organization controlling IT, the users will eventually take it away from you. And so my goal, and I'm going to rest it firmly on the protection of veterans' private information, is to figure out how to, how to skip the whole trough of that cycle provide the users what they really want and still be able to provide controls around what I actually have to control. Um, but I don't have to control a lot of things in order to control that information protection. Um, so I, I think you know, when you get to that third level of cloud, that's the really interesting one because that's not where an enterprise controls the tool, that's where the individual controls the tool and that's hard from a, uh, from a government standpoint. You must like, like my long-winded answers, okay? It was good. It was good. Thank you. Sir? You mentioned um, in the beginning of your statement about cloud uh, consolidation into DISA. When do you anticipate starting that, you know, some of those processes, and when do you anticipate that being completed? So we have been engaged with uh, DOD since uh, about October of last year in the discussion of the joint uh, electronic health record system. Um, the work with DISA has uh, come out of that recently. Um, we are, you know, we're in the midst of those discussions and nailing things down. Um, as I classify, as I said to someone else, you know, uh, uh, Terry Takai and I have agreed that the answer is yes, and now we've asked folks to figure out how to figure out how to make that, you know, the, the yes answer. It's, um, it's a logical thing to do at the very uh, root of how DOD and VA will continue to work together on electronic health record systems. Um, so, you know, progress has begun. 
Uh, progress is not turning back, but there's a lot of work to be done here. Thank you. Oh, sorry, we have a lady here with me. Another ringer, by the way. <laughs> um, hi, Roger. We, uh, Kathy Conrad with Jefferson Consulting. Um, earlier today, we spoke a little bit about free RFP collaboration and the Mythbusters campaign and the importance of uh, collaboration between the IT folks, business owners, and acquisition, including with industry. Could you talk a little bit about what VA is doing to facilitate that kind of collaboration? So, um, th thanks for the, for the great question, and at the risk of, uh, I won't use any brand names, but there is an entire day session tomorrow with uh, VA and the 16 major initiative leads to talk to industry about exactly what we're doing and what we're looking for. I think that's a great example. Uh, and I give kudos to uh, Steve Schleichman, who runs the IT part of those major initiatives for, uh, for putting that together. Um, so for those of you unlucky enough to also be going to that, you'll hear me about 14 hours from now. <laughs> Hopefully not saying an awful lot of the same things. Um, we'll be talking uh, mostly about the major initiatives. We, um, there's a lot of kudos to hand out in here. Um, Glenn Hagstrom and his team reached out to uh, uh, the folks that were being bracked up at uh, US Army Seacom in Fort Monmouth a couple of years ago. They have stood up what we call our Technology Acquisition Center. Uh, every dollar of IT spend, external to IT, uh, sorry, major IT spend will eventually go through the TAC. I think it does now. Everything is about $125,000. Um, they're putting out the, uh, the T4 uh, contract to really serve IT needs there. They're highly responsive. They're very professional. Um, you know, it seems to me that uh, the more the more comfortable an IT an acquisition executive is with their role, uh, the more freedom the organization has to discuss uh, requirements and potential solutions uh, with the private sector. Uh, you know, I actually uh, am pretty pleased with the process we've gone through on this open source to this point that ended up with an RFP that came out uh, about a Friday and a half ago. We have been, I, I probably have talked to over a hundred organizations and I know over a thousand people have had input through uh, classic mechanisms, RFI responses, um, and just listening um, sort of things. We've had industry uh, reports, we've had, had academic reports. To me, I think that a lot of times the right way around this is to recognize early on that you don't know what the answer is. And recognize that you've got a lot of market research to do before you get to the point of even thinking about an RFP. There's a point at which it becomes appropriate to uh, just, just to ensure uh, a level playing field from a competition. There's a point at which it becomes appropriate to say, I can't talk about this much anymore. Uh, I can no longer tell you that I plan on spending $11.2 million and my preferred vendor is, oh, sorry. Um, you, you know, you get to a point where uh, where you follow those processes, but if you've really done a lot of, if you started out with the mode of, I don't know what the answer is, let me go talk to a lot of people and find out, I think you can do a, uh, a great job of doing that, and I think acquisition folks can help you get to that point. You have to be conscious, though, of what the laws are and what you are constrained by. And I, I love the Mythbusters campaign because there are a lot of myths out there. Um, now, I will say that not all of them are myths. Um, when the IG insists that they would investigate you for it, it's not a myth. <laughs> um, and so, you know, there, there is that aspect of it as well. But, um, and let's not forget that unlike um, the commercial folks in, in the room, uh, those of us with a federal badge actually can go to jail for doing things that really, you know, technically don't harm anybody, but boy, if you're not doing it for the law, I guess you can. Um, and, and I think we all are a little bit wary of that. I know that my primary objective to my staff, when we came up with the CIO's priorities my first day, 
Priority number one is do not go to jail as a result of taking this job. My deputy bought me a t-shirt that says do not go to jail uh, on it. So every once in a while we pull that t-shirt out, we slide it out, and then we have a conversation about the topic we're talking about. Um, okay, sorry, I'm long with it. There's a lady in front of us or something. Hi, um, your organization was cited in the 25-point plan as one of the first ones that implemented marginal development at job. Can you speak about that? Sure. Um, we, uh, we utilize agile development to deliver the, uh, the new GI Bill system, uh, deliver it on time, uh, four major releases. Um, there was unanimous agreement when we started that we couldn't complete it. Um, there wasn't quite unanimous uh, cheering at the end. I'm guessing from GAO, but that's a different story. Um, <laughs> But the system is in and it works very, very well. What we love about Agile uh, is it brings the customer into the loop, irrevocably. You can't do Agile without the customer in the loop. If you're planning on doing Agile and your customer says, let me give you the requirements document and I'll come back in a year and a half, don't do Agile. Um, if your customer says, it's a complex system, I'm going to have to be here with you every day to make certain that, you know, that your folks understand exactly what they're building, now you've got the possibility for, for Agile. Um, get folks to understand what Agile really means. The processes are different. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things where, yes, you can't hurt yourself uh, if, if you don't know what you're doing. We're, we're getting to the point now where we've got enough expertise in Agile to begin doing it on uh, multiple programs. Uh, I put it in the category of what we use when we care enough to send the very best. But I got 110 ongoing uh, 110 active IT projects and probably the, uh, the skill and capacity to do Agile on maybe three or four. Um, we want to build that, but we're also not indicating to folks that that's the only way they'll do it. Incremental is the only thing possible inside of the VA. Thou shalt not have a customer facing milestone delivery longer than six months. Agile is one way of, of addressing that. A good one. Way in the back. Bill, you're next. If nobody asks, that raises their hand, you've got to ask one. Hi, Denise Peterson with Input, so I'll see you tomorrow. Mm. Um, <laughs> my question is around, um, you mentioned early on that you were, uh, you had saved 700 million from your efforts over, I guess, the past couple of years. And it brought to mind kind of this perception um, that cost savings or driving cost savings is uh, a double-edged sword in government because there's no guarantee that you'll be able to keep those savings and reinvest them. And I'm wondering, is that changing now? Is the bigger threat now Congress looking too closely at IT programs in particular? Um, in the 2011 uh, budget as passed, uh, just over $300 million of that 700 was pulled back by Congress. Uh, to help meet the financial goals of the budget. Do have another question? <laughs> Sorry. Hi, Roger. You, you say that, um, you know, you try to say yes to everything, um, but you also have that big security and you have that monthly reporting kind of thing. So what do you do when your debt sec or your CTO or someone says, here, I want this iPad or Android, and I want it on the network when it's not secure? So how do you balance the need for new technology, which everybody wants, and actually your security requirements? So that's a great question, and I'll give you a very specific example, because those of you that have seen uh, Scott Poole, our deputy secretary lately, will know that he's carrying an iPad. <laughs> yeah. um, you, when, when you uh, provide it to him as part of a pilot program, um, you know, where we have specifically, <laughs> actually, that wasn't a joke, we actually have a pilot program to, uh, to make certain that we're, that we're familiar enough with uh, iPads, and there are a limited set of users for those, and he became a member of the pilot. Um, very astute political decision on our part to authorize him into the pilot. <laughs> you do explain to him, uh, Deputy Secretary Gould is a former uh, Navy captain in Navy intelligence. 
Uh, you do explain to him that um, the reason it has not been authorized as a device throughout the organization is that there are bona fide concerns relative to um, uh, how firm things like encryption and, and other things, you know, how well protected some of the information is um, and what the limitations are from that standpoint, what he should and should not do. And a great example coming to myself is uh, about two years ago I decided that since I commute, I mean, I'm a green commuter, um, I'm an hour each way on the bus and the train, um, which gives me an hour each way on my Blackberry fundamentally. And I said, no, a Kindle would be a heck of a lot nice. more friendly form factor for that. And I get all these PDFs and things that I got to read, and so I started taking everything that I got that needed reading and loading it onto a Kindle and reading it on the way home. And about a week into that, my ISO, who works for me, but she runs information security at Baco, came in and literally took it off my desk. <laughs> and came back a day later and said, let me tell you two things about this device. It's a huge unencrypted USB stick, and it has no password. So all this stuff marked for official use only, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> if it's not public information, you cannot put it on the Kindle. I don't read a lot of stuff after it becomes public information, I gotta tell you. <laughs> um, and so um, the usefulness kind of knows that at, at, at that point. Um, and so I think you see the same sort of thing. We have, um, we have a variety of obligations for information protection, not just PAI and PHI. Uh, and we've got to work inside the context of the outside at the same time. I will tell you that I have uh, a project ongoing uh, right now where I've told my folks, I don't want to say no to those devices anymore. I want to know how I say yes. Tell me what I can say that is yes to these things. Because the one thing you can guarantee uh, for the 100,000 medical residents a year that come in to do training at the VA is they are carrying a mobile device. Oh, sorry, two things you can guarantee. And they know where all those great internet websites are that would help them do their job better if only that dumb CIO back in Washington wouldn't insist on crazy rules like veterans' information must be encrypted and be stored uh, or all, all those sort of things. Um, <coughs> sorry, I'm in story mode here. Um, we did have a... a uh, a VISN director. So the VISN directors inside of VA are the folks that run five hospitals or so. You know, they'll have 30,000 people working for them and a lot of doctors. And one of the VISN directors uh, clearly on my side because he kept getting told by his doctors, we don't understand why we can't use these mobile devices. And finally he brought a group of them in and he said, you can use them. And they looked at me and said, absolutely. I just want to see each of you enter all of your banking information, passwords, and pins on the device. And then you can go use it. Because <laughs> if you lose it, I want to make sure you've got some skin in the game. Yeah. <laughs> you know, none of them took them up on that. <laughs> but that's the way you've got to think about protecting veterans' personal information. If it won't go on a device where you're willing to put all of your banking information, your pins, your passwords, don't put veterans' information on it. Mm -hmm. And that includes paper, as where did I see? I saw Jason, I saw several reporters in here. They know how I hate paper. Did I see a question back here? No, not all right. So, um, way in the back of the room is a gentleman named Bill Goller. He is uh, the CIO of one of our uh, facilities. He's my shadow for two weeks. Bill just raised his hand, and he has a question. He's got about five seconds to think of what it is. <laughs> we'll send the mic around to you slowly. So this is definitely a ringer question. We'll find out if he passes. He, you know, former Marine Colonel, I doubt he's going to pass. Thank you, Mr. Baker. I appreciate the, the opportunity. <laughs> What is the most important IT investment decision that you're contemplating for the VA in the near term? Wow. I guess he needs a promotion. What's up, sir? Are you 
sure you need the back ringer. <laughs> <laughs> or he should come work for us. <laughs> yeah. um, actually, I think um, right now that the major things are completing the execution of the major initiatives. Uh, we have opportunity to put more dollars on some of those. Uh, one of the great things about having the consolidated budget is, you know, a lot of times what you see in the press is if something isn't executing well, we pull money away from it. What you don't see is that if it is executing well, we actually push more money onto it. And inside of that consolidated budget, we have the opportunity to do that. And so programs like uh, the Veterans Benefits Management System uh, may well grow as we identify things that are underperforming and start putting dollars on that because it is performing well. Um, we also, just frankly, are, are starting our roll up into the prioritized FY12 execution plan. One of the things I think you saw in, uh, if it wasn't in the 25 point plan, it was in what, uh, uh, what Vivek was talking about relative to um, capabilities that CIOs need. Because we have uh, multi-year dollars, and we have multi-year dollars, and we have the ability to do uh, what's called a baseline reprogramming. So once Congress passes an appropriation for FY12, I have 30 days to send them a letter that says, we're still spending exactly the same amount of money, but we're gonna move it from point A to point B. And what's great about that is that, you know, if you look at the budgeting process, we start two years in advance of a budget being passed try to decide what it is we're going to want to do. I have a lot better visibility into exactly where those dollars need to be spent. When I'm looking at the fiscal year from October 1st forward, and I'm looking at it from right at the end of September when we put our prioritized operating plan together. So we're looking at, you know, do we have the right dollars on all those investments inside of FY12? And that will happen over the next couple of months as that roll up to the prioritized operating plan. So uh, thank you, Congressman, for that question. Um, anything else? Over here. How is the continuing resolution affecting your ability to execute your plans? We have a budget now. Um, but you can't start a new project. Oh, no, we've... Technically. Hmm. <laughs> I haven't had any problem. Um, hope I haven't done anything illegal. <laughs> Where's that t-shirt? <laughs> um, no, we've, uh, we've had no issues. Now, I actually haven't faced that problem. Um, I may be under the mistaken impression that, uh, that I got a budget, um, that I'm out executing it at, at this point. Um, for a period of time, we looked at making certain that we weren't doing any new starts. Um, I don't recall doing that since the... Uh, all the generations relative to the uh, uh, passage of the budget and the rescission of three hundred million dollars. Maybe Brian related to that because it's CR. How did the pending government shutdown affect your operations, or did it affect your operations? And obviously, we have another potential government shutdown coming on the debt ceiling. So the, the good news um, from a uh, from a VA perspective is, you know, we we just kept going. Uh, we kept our contingency plans up to date, and we had folks making certain that they were uh, well understood. Um, you know, 80 some percent of VA has advanced appropriations uh, in, in VHA. Um, and trust me, the Secretary says thank you to the Hill every day uh, for having done that when it paid benefits big time this year. Um, and clearly, a lot of what uh, my organization does is support medical care. Uh, so we pretty much tried to make certain that everybody just stayed focused on keep going. A lot of confidence that we weren't going to have a shutdown. It turned out to be exactly right. Um, but making certain that we knew what we were going to do. I think, I think the biggest thing was making certain that we were sending the signal to folks. Um, you know, don't worry about it. If we get to the point where we need to tell you something, we know what, you know, what and where, but for right now, just keep going. Uh, and I think that was the right way to look at it. You can't spend uh, your life looking at everything that could possibly uh, interrupt what you're doing. Um, you you got to get on with it. You got to have your plans there, but you got to get on with it. 
So I'm familiar with a 2% across the board uh, cut as part of the budget. <coughs> Is that the one you're asking about? Oh, no, the 2% withholding on um, you know, all federal contracts starting January 1st, 2012. I don't have a clue. No, we will talk about that. Okay. <laughs> you can educate me. It's great because acquisitions is separate. So I'm sure Glenn Hankstrom knows exactly what the answer to that one is. I just, I'm his customer. I love being somebody's customer. <laughs> this, is, this is good stuff. And he does a good job for me. So with that, I'm going to uh, say thanks. Enjoyed it. Uh, I love the survey. Walter, good job. Thanks again. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Thank you.